All right, Ilka. It's yeah. so great that we have our archaeology club meeting here to learn all about your work um, with the Glen Ellen Castle right in our own backyard of Lock Raven Reservoir. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Let me see if I can share my screen. Awesome. Okay. So I want to start my slideshow. From the beginning. Okay. All right. Can you all see that? Hopefully, thumbs up. Good. Great. Well, it's nice to see everybody online, even though we can't see each other in person. I wanted to thank Bronwyn for always being such a wonderful technical wizard and welcoming everybody. Um, and we do have Chief Luke Brackett with us tonight. I'm going to wait to get through my slides and I'm going to ask him um, just to share a little bit on the project. Um, let me get started here. All right, so this is the first project that we've actually done for the um, Natural History Society of Maryland Archaeology Club. We were, we, we were born in 2019 um, and we've had some, some get-togethers, some um, exciting things that we've done, but this is our first archaeological excavation that we did. So um, this was really, really exciting to me and I'm glad to be able to share this with you. Let's see. I have a number of slides I wanna get through, but they're not, some of them are pretty quick. So I wanna explain the history behind the, the house, the castle to you all so you can understand where our project went and what our results were, what some of our results have been so far. Okay. So just to orient you of the area that we're talking about, it's um, it's in Maryland, it's in Lock Raven, Raven Res Reservoir. So for Baltimore County, you're kind of in this, this is the old timey map, you're in this area here. And if you go to Google Maps, somebody's actually plotted it now on Google Maps. So it's, it's really easy to find. Now this map is just beautiful. I, um, this is from 1843 and it's a surveyor's map. Now the orientation, let me show you here, it's a little bit confusing. North is over here in your upper right-hand corner and South is in your lower left. So this survey map gives us a lot of information. Um, this is the Hampton uh, plantation and all the land that Glen Ellen sits on right now used to belong to the Ridgely family who owned Hampton. So Glen Ellen, if you're familiar with Hampton, the Hampton house is here and the gardens. Glen Ellen is up here to the north and you can see if you look really closely, it says Glen Ellen, the property of R. Gilmore. And then 695 runs about right here now. And the land to the south was another Ridgely daughter property and it was known as Ebsen Farm. And they ended up selling that to uh, Goucher College. So that's where Goucher College is located today. So Robert Gilmore Jr. is what he's normally referred to as. He purchased this land from Priscilla Ridgely White. And he bought that on June 18th, 1832. And he bought 1,037 acres at $18 an acre. That's right, one eight, eighteen dollars an acre. Can you imagine what it's worth now? Okay. This is an older topo map from a topography map from 1871, and here you can see some of the buildings that are actually plotted out on Glen Ellen. Um, right in here is where the castle was built, and. The original drive came across here. This is what was known as Delaney Valley Pike. So it's Delaney Valley Road now. And their driveway for Glen Ellen, the instructions were to turn off at Kane's Tavern. Now, I don't know exactly where Kane's Tavern is. I've got some feelers out with my historical people, but I think the tavern and the driveway are under what is now the Pine Ridge Golf Course. And the east entrance, that's from the west, you could come up that way and drive across or just ride your horse right up here. 
and uh, from the east, where you could come from Providence Road, where Providence Road ended, and then you could swing around in their back drive there. And you can also see here, the red lines on a topo map show you the height. So you can see, if you go out to the site today, if you're familiar with it, you can follow this right around, because this is all water now. This is all under the Lock Raven Reservoir. And this is where the Pine Ridge Golf Course is today, just to orient you. This is Robert Gilmore Jr. The um, drawing on the left was done in Paris in 1828. The one on the right, I'm not sure what, they, what year that was taken, but I'm assuming it was pretty close to that because he still pr looks pretty young in that. And the reason he's known as Robert Gilmore Jr. is because there was a Robert Gilmore Sr. But Robert Gilmore Sr. is actually his grandfather. And this is the grandfather that comes from Scotland. And you'll notice there's a Scottish, their Scottish heritage is very important to them. And it plays out a lot in the story of the Glen Ellen Castle. So Robert Gilmore Sr., then it's William Gilmore is actually the father. And Robert Gilmore Jr. is the one that builds Glen Ellen Castle. Um, this is a picture of Robert Gilmore Sr. It was painted by Gilbert Stewart. And if you guys are familiar with Gilbert Stewart, he painted the very famous portrait of George Washington. So that'll tell you a little bit about the economic status of Robert Gilmore Sr. He got a little bit of money on him. And um, this picture is actually from the, or is located at the Baltimore Museum of Art. So um, unfortunately slavery, as it does with Maryland history, runs through this entire story. And we know that Robert Gilmore Sr. had um, enslaved persons from the runway ad that was in, placed in the paper in 1870, or excuse me, 1786, where he had an enslaved person named Ned who had run away. Um, what's interesting I thought about this ad was that if he was taken within five miles of Baltimore town, um, they got the $5 reward, but it was higher if it was taken outside of that area because they would be reimbursed for their traveling charges. Robert Gilmore Jr. Um, comes back from his European tour, which I'll tell you about in just a bit, and he marries Ellen Ward. She is the daughter of a well-known Baltimore judge at this time. And um, he marries Ellen and he buys this land, this property from the Ridgelys and he names it Glen Ellen after his wife and the Glen part is from his Scottish heritage. And this, I apologize, this is not a very good um, uh, picture but this was the best I could do from the Baltimore County Historical Society. This is the plat of the land when Robert Gilmore Jr. bought it. So um, the orange arrow is your north. Um, so Robert Gilmore Jr. basically splits his land up. Here's the, here's the castle here, here's the terrace. Um, the, on the west is gonna be mostly fields and all those fields are just about underwater now. Um, he calls this section New Market. He calls the east section Raven's Rock. And that has more of the orchards and the wooded area. And up here in this corner is actually the paddock. So of course, Robert Gilmore Jr., when he builds his house, he wants to build it bigger and better than his neighbors who he bought the land from. And this is a picture of the Hampton house um, that the Ridgely's owned. It's a historical picture. So Robert Gilmore Jr. Built, um, hires an architect and asks him to model the estate on Sir Walter Scott's estate in Scotland, which was called Abbotsford. Abbotsford actually still exists. And you can see from the architectural drawings, it was um, supposed to look a lot like Abbotsford there. Um, Robert Gilmore Jr. had visited uh, Sir Walter Scott's house when he was in Scotland on his tour. Um, unfortunately, you can tell by the architectural drawing, it was originally supposed to be five stories. It ended up being two stories. And that's because he ran out of money 
Um, he spent $75,000 on the house and his dad basically cut him off and said, that's enough. Um, $75,000 in today's money would be 2.2 million. So he didn't get to implement all the gardens that he wanted to do. This is a picture of the house when it was finished, the two-story the two story uh, castle. Um, Glen Ellen is actually the earliest American Gothic revival mansion in the United States. So there's a lot of ar architectural people that are interested in it as well. So there was a little bit more um, information on it than you would normally find. This is another shot of the house. Um, you can see those, this is the porch is south facing and there's this, uh, the bay of windows here. And I will tell you a little story about these two trees here in a little bit. These are orange Osage trees. So the castle itself um, is very fancy. It has a ballroom that occupies the entire middle section of the second floor. And it has a circular stairwell, it has a skylight of colored glass. The drawing room measures 40 foot long. The dining hall runs the entire width of the house. There's 25 bedrooms. The stone for the house was all quarried on site. Of course, he has over a thousand acres, so he would have that. And there are some um, stories, some articles about, there was also a cell for unruly slaves, but imagine that's probably in the basement part. There was also outbuildings. So there were slave um, or servants quarters, a smoke house, an ice house, a spring house or a dairy, the stables, uh, barns. There was the white house where the manager of the farm lived um, pre-Civil War that would have been the overseer of the plantation. We think the white house is actually, um, the remains of that is um, probably on Goose Island now, which is in Lock Raven Reservoir. And Robert Gilmore is kind of all over the place as far as style because their guest house is built like a Greek temple. The gate house is fashioned after a Gothic ruin. And of course there's the gardens, the kitchen gardens, but he also had terrace gardens that had a drawbridge and a moat. This picture is kind of interesting because again, it's from the, the, you have the south facing porch but over here you have what I think might be two separate buildings and I don't know which ones these are. I can't tell if this is one building here or is this a smaller building and this is a, um, some kind of structure. And also, I don't know if you guys can see, I think there's two people standing here. If not, it looks very ghost-like. So Robert and Ellen are very prolific. They end up having 11 children, um, all but the first one are all born in Glen Ellen. Out of the 11 children, they have nine boys and two girls. Six of those nine boys fight for the Confederacy during the Civil War. And Howard and Arthur actually die in the war. One of the more well-known uh, Gilmore offspring is Harry Gilmore. Um, he wrote a book, I don't know if you guys can see this, Four Years in the Saddle. Um, it's an interesting read. I think if you read it, you should probably take it with a grain of salt because uh, if it's all true, Harry was basically everywhere and he did everything. He was kind of like the um, Captain America of the Confederacy, or I guess that would be Captain Confederacy. But um, there's a famous episode that's written about quite a bit where he comes, he's promoted to Colonel in the Confederate army. And he is tasked with coming to uh, Baltimore, to Timonium, the Texas area to uh, destroy the railroad. So he does um, rip up the railroad lines at um, Texas and he goes eastward from there um, because he's like, I'm gonna go visit my family. So he just bold as you please, goes from Timonium over to Glen Ellen, which really isn't that far as the crow flies, and rides up the drive to go say hi to his mother. Um, after the war, he's also well known for this, he was a Baltimore police commissioner from 1874 to 1879. And every picture I've been able to find of him, you only see one side of his face. Uh, 
he was shot several times during the war and um, one was in his, he got shot in the jaw. So um, he, he actually ends up dying from complications from this wound in 1883. So while there are a lot of books and paintings on um, people that are more wealthy, um, sometimes you have to dig a little deeper, and that's not a intended pun, um, to find the history of all the people at an archaeological site. So in the 1840 census, I know this is really hard to read, um, there's categories down here that I, I don't know if you can see it on, on here. I try to make it a little bit bigger. Um, so basically, it's a tally of people that uh, are living on this land that are not the family. And they're divided by color, by sex, and by whether or not they're free or enslaved. So down at the bottom, it actually has, um, there was a total of 11 free white people that were living there, um, three people of color that were free, and 17 uh, enslaved people that were living on the land in 1840. Now with these tally marks there, um, there, was, uh, there are no names that we know of except for one. I found one name and that is unfortunately because it was in a uh, enslaved person advertisement. So you know that slave owners would uh, place runaway advertisements in local papers and attempt to retrieve their escape, um, escaped enslaved people. But there are also advertisements that are placed by county sheriffs who are trying to return the runaways to their owners. So there are people that would um, basically slave catchers that would go around and they would um, you know, capture these people if they didn't have the proper documentation. And one of these people was Levi Costley. Now Levi says he is a runaway and then he belongs to Robert Gilmore Jr. of Baltimore County. They give a physical description of Levi. He's 35 years old, five foot nine and three quarter inches in height and has a light complexion. His jaws are considerably scarred from the king's evil. And the king's evil is, I won't pronounce this right, sclerphoma, sclerphoa, which is basically, um, it is um, tuberculosis that presents outside of the lungs. So it's a swelling of lymph glands. It's usually in this area and it's like a, it looks like a bacterial infection. So um, he also has a right thigh that has been amputated and he walks with a crutch. So he's not in the best of physical health. Um, this ad was placed by the sheriff of the Baltimore City and County Jail on October 27th of 1840. There's a um, follow-up to Lou, Levi Costley in the Maryland archives. And unfortunately, it's because um, the family goes to retrieve his body. So between October 27th and January 2nd of the following year, 1841, uh, Levi Costley dies in custody. Uh, it, cause of death was not given. So we don't know if it was from natural causes um, or if there was some other um, reason that that occurred. Yes. We did find uh, three certificates of freedom and a certificate of freedom is a legal document that was issued to African-Americans who were required to record proof of their freedom in the county court. And if a person was previously manumitted by the act of a slaveholder, the county clerk would look up that manumitting document before they would issue a certificate of freedom. So you had it listed on the certificate of freedom, um, the person, a physical description, the person who freed them, their owner, and also a witness. So in 1832, we have Sarah, who's listed as Negro Sarah. She's freed by William Gilmore, which who is Robert Gilmore Jr.'s father. Um, she's described as light-skinned with a small mole on her chin. And the witness is actually Robert Gilmore Jr. 1839, Robert Gilmore Jr. actually frees Ann Barnes. Um, Ann Barnes is described as light-skinned and straight reddish colored hair. I apologize, these aren't, these documents are very hard to read. 
And the third certificate of freedom that I was able to find was um, for Reuben Brown in 1838. He's raised in Baltimore County. Um, his physical description is that he's considerably scarred from the effects of smallpox. And what I think is the reason he was actually freed here was that his hand is much swollen and disfigured. So if he couldn't walk, work anymore, they probably went ahead and um, set him free so they wouldn't have to have, house him or clothe him or feed him. Now, what's interesting is that Reuben Brown, his last name, um, there's the family at Hampton, which also has the last name of Brown, that a family of enslaved people. And in 1838, Polly Batty was freed by the Bridgeleys at Hampton and her father was Ambrose Brown. So I don't know if it was just coincidental that they both, um, they freed these people at the same time or there was some reason that both of them were freed. We also find a property assessment from December the 23rd, 1846, which lists the enslaved people on there. Um, this list is, uh, if anybody knows what DU means, it's abbreviation under here where it has uh, 10 Negroes under 14 years and this is three DU males. And it goes on to say that I, Originally, I thought it might mean dozen, but um, dozen doesn't add up to the the values that they've assigned um, to these oops to these people. Um, dang it! Okay, so if anybody knows, they can send me something in the in the chat box there. Um, so again, there's a list, but it doesn't have anybody's name because the enslaved people are listed as chattel and that's why you don't have the individual names. However, we did find one name again from 1846. And again, it's because there's a runaway ad that was uh, placed by Robert Gilmore Jr. Um, for a Stephen who had escaped from him. Um, Stephen's 21 years old, he's small for his age. Uh, they're not sure if he headed at once for the Pennsylvania line um, or he stayed in Baltimore where he had some acquaintances. I was hoping, I didn't find any more mention of him. So I hope that he made it to the Pennsylvania line. Eighteen fifty census, you have the, the family, the Gilmore family listed, and then you also have some Irish workers that are listed there. So, um, that was pretty interesting. 1860, uh, you don't have the indentured servants um, listed anymore, but you do have, you only have one person from Germany that he may have been a tutor um, or he may just have been somebody visiting. And in the 1870 census, um, there's the family of course that are living there has been reduced because they're growing up and moving away. Um, two of the boys died in the civil war but you do have what's listed now, and then remember this is after the Civil War, five years after the end of it, you have two female black domestic servants listed in the census. You have Mary Scovens, who's 21 years old, and you have Mary Batty, who's 13. And Batty is another Hampton name. So Harry Gilmore owns the property. Um, well, his father dies sorry, Robert Gilmore Jr. dies in 1875. Harry Gilmore takes over the castle. Um, he stays there till right before his death in 1883 when he sells it to Magruder Wilson. Wilson sells it to a Bunting. Bunting sells it to Henry L. Brack. And then Mr. Brack sells, starts selling off the parcels of land from 1912 to 1920 to Baltimore City. And that's because um, they're gonna build the, the reservoir out there. Nineteen twenty-three, the city actually buys the castle itself because they're going to use it as retreat for poor mothers during the summer. And this was done. Uh, this project was promoted by the Family Welfare Association. Unfortunately, because the water level is so high now out there, because of the reservoir, they can't get a septic system to work in the house, 
and this project just falls by the wayside. In addition, um, there's uh, local reports of beer parties being held by college kids. And the local kids would actually bring the roller skates to skate on that big ballroom floor that was in there. And during prohibition, the officials find a still in the castle. Um, all this adds up to, um, especially with the house starting to deteriorate, which you can see in this picture here, which um, I think this is very interesting because you can see the reservoir in the distance here. So this is, you're facing west here and there's a, you've been to the site, there's a hill behind the house. So somebody was standing on this to take this photo. In 1929, the city takes down the house. Um, some reports say that it was dynamited. Here's a couple more pictures of the de deterioration of the site. There's um, stones have started to fall off. There's ivy grow growing up the walls. Um, this is the, the famous bay window, all dry, you know, all grown up with um, ivy. And uh, this is another poignant picture, I think, because you're inside the house looking out and you can see the reservoir. So it must have been a fantastic view at one point. So this brings us to the reason that we had the Glen Ellen Castle Archaeological Survey. We, um, we did this survey in conjunction with the Baltimore Environmental Police and our goals were twofold. One was that we were gonna register the site as an archeological site. And the second was uh, that we were gonna install a historical marker to tell people about the site and hopefully stop people from um, digging and disturbing the ground out there. We have not gotten the historical marker yet, but we were successful in registering it as a site. There's our site number, yay, 18BA622 which is basically 18 is the county um, or the state, Baltimore is the BA and the 622 is the 622nd site that's been registered in, in um, Baltimore. We did uh, find out exactly where the castle was. We, we assumed we knew kind of where it was, but um, we did find the foundation. And one of the things you can see here is that orange Osage tree that's in this picture, I am fairly certain that this is the same tree that's sitting right here because it's right on the end of the terrace and it's very similar in shape. Now, of course, you know, this is, this picture is probably taken in 1921. So it's almost hundred years old. Um, the bay window here corresponds with the remains of the foundation that we found over in this section. So we did find the exact location of the castle. Um, when we were out there, we did find um, what was probably a site of a midden, uh, which is a trash heap. It could have been from the kitchen of the house. Unfortunately, there was some modern trash mixed in with that. So um, it was kind of a polluted site. So we didn't, we didn't collect that. But we did do, um, we did shovel test pits. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it's basically you take a shovel and you dig a pit. Um, we mapped it out. Here's where the house was located. And we went right down the line and did the shovel test pits. You can see here the pink, pink flags. We went every so, every so often. Um, to dig a pit is you just dig straight down with a shovel. It's probably between 12 to 80, 18 inches wide. Normally on this site, I think we went down about maybe 12 to 18 inches. You go down until you hit sterile soil. Sometimes that's where you hit bedrock here. It was just, you could tell from looking at the soil that it was undisturbed. So we wouldn't find anything if we went further down into it. Then we take that dirt and we screen it. So our screeners were out here um, and you literally shake it. It goes, the dirt goes through the screen and what you're left with is artifacts. And then you take those artifacts and you put them into, um, you can see here, individual bags that are all labeled. So you know exactly which artifacts came from which test pit. So we can catalog all that and map it out. We did have a um, washing session, which we got all the artifacts washed with, and we were beginning to catalog them and COVID hit. So, 
unfortunately, um, most of them have been done. They're sitting downstairs at the Natural History Society of Maryland's place in Overly, just waiting for us to come back. I'm sure they're very lonely for us. Uh, in a cataloging sheet, you literally take each of the artifacts that you sign, that you find, and you list it on this cataloging sheet. And um, once we get it all together, it will tell us a story. You can see there's a, a button on here. There's some ceramics. Um, actually, this button needs to be cleaned a little bit more. But I did want to tell you, so we haven't finished working with the artifacts, um, like I said, but we did find, I wanted to tell you my favorite three that we found. Um, this little shard right here, if you can make it out, there's an A and there's a space and there's an A. And this is because it's from a very famous at the time, very popular, Rebecca at the Well teapot. And this is called Rockingham Ware. And um, the cool thing about archeology span is you can be a expert in any little tiny thing. And Rockingham Ware, there are books and books and books written on just the Rockingham Ware in America. This one's in American culture, 1830 to 1930. And what's cool about this is while a lot of people had this teapot, this teapot was actually made in Baltimore by the E and W Bennett company was also known as the Edward Bennett company later on and they made this teapot from 1855 till 1870 so that places it exactly during the occupation of the castle my other favorite thing was um, this you can see the size of the shard down here on the tray it was a pretty big um, shard and when we pulled it out we were like we were pretty certain that it was uh, some type of liquid, liquid container. Our first guess was maybe rum because if you can make, if you can see here, it looks like a U and an M. So we did a little research and one of the cool things about archeology span too is that you meet people who have a variety of different interests. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ernie Dimmler. Um, he's one of my favorite people. He is um, the curator for the Baltimore the Broma Seltzer Tower down in Baltimore. And he has, he knows more about Broma Seltzer bottles than anybody in the world. He has the largest collection. He's such a neat guy. So he knows everything about these type of, any kind of liquid container. Um, I went to him and I showed him a couple of pictures. I was like, Ernie, do you have any idea? Is this a rum bottle? What do you think? Two days later, Bibbidi Bobby Boo, he gets back to me and says, oh, this is a seltzer water bottle. So uh, I looked up online and you could find, I'm not even gonna pronounce, try to pronounce that, Herzogtum. It's seltzer water from the Duchy of Nassau in the Kingdom of Prussia. Now the Kingdom of Prussia only existed from 1806 to 1866. Um, and at this time in America, it was very fashionable for people of means to import their seltzer water from Europe because Seltzer water was, um, it was a help for your digestion. So this, again, this places it, the time frame places it during the occupation of the castle. Um, of course it could have been reused, but I'm assuming the first use was probably by the family because um, enslaved people probably would not have had the um, means, financial means to import their seltzer water from Europe at that time. So all these, we're gonna finish cataloging all these artifacts when COVID is over. So we might find some more interesting stories. Um, and this is a first for me, as far as any archeological dig that I've been on, this is the largest artifact that has been, that you found reused somewhere else. And I am the queen of, you can ask my son, I'm the queen of recycling, repurpose, reuse. These, uh, remember the bay window at Glen Ellen? these Gothic tracery windows, right before the, um, they took down the, the city took down the castle, Sumner Parker and his uh, wife were building a home over in Lutherville, which is known as the Cloisters. If you guys have ever, you're probably familiar with it. If, if you've ever get a chance, you have to go see this building. It is incredible. So those Gothic tracery windows are right here. They are reused. Um, they were taken from Sumner, Sumner Parker, took them from the site and reused them in his house 
So they are actually there in Lutherville and they are um, still very beautiful. So William Gilmore, who's the, the son of Robert Gilmore Jr. Um, there's lots of Williams and lots of Roberts. He owns Summerfield, which is a plantation that's about a mile as a crow flies from the Glen Ellen site. Um, he's the vice president of the Baltimore Delta Railroad. Then he's president of the Maryland Central Railroad. So he has quite a bit of land and quite a bit of money. And it's his idea to sell the property for the reservoir. He ends up selling 500 acres from Summerfield. And we actually went over, um, one of my historical guys and I went over to Summerfield. This is a, it's, you can go visit it today. They rent it on Airbnb. Um, it's very modernized in the middle, but this is a picture of Summerfield. And this is the enslaved person's um, cabin that's still there. It's a private residence, so we couldn't go in it. But um, so William owns this land. He, he owns Summerfield. He decides that we should, they should sell the property for a reservoir. And in his own words, they were talking about when the first transfer of land had been completed, the city commissioners asked Mr. Gilmore, would he provide a name for this reservoir? And he talked about the memories of the days when he would ride through the estate with his father and they would pass a certain great rock that rose 250 feet up above the shore of the Gunpowder River. And Robert would say to his son, remember son, this is Raven Rock. Well, Raven Rock appears to be an inspiration from the classic American tale, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Well, it just so happens Washington Irving is a very good friend and regular correspondent of Robert Gilmore Jr. So this is where Raven's Rock comes into it. William decides to take the Raven from Raven's Rock and the lock from their Scottish heritage and recommends the name Lock Raven. And that's how we come up with the Lock Raven Reservoir name. So we have William Gilmore to thank for that. Um, the more I got into the research of this, I realized there's a lot of information there. Um, Hampton is doing a big um, project on enslaved, people, enslaved persons. So if you, anybody knows a college student's looking for a thesis or a dissertation and has the time and the energy or anybody doesn't have to be a student and wants to do more research, there's um, at the Maryland Room of the Pratt Library, there's an unpublished memoir uh, that Robert Gilmore Jr. wrote himself. Uh, Hampton, of course, has all their historical background, the Ridgely Papers and their Enslaved Persons Project that they're working on and Goucher College, um, when they bought the land from the Chu family descendants, there was a provision in there in 1921 that said that no uh, person of African descent could ever own or live on this land and this, this um, kind of thing. Um, and Goucher College has done a, their project is called a hallowed gown project where they publicly acknowledge this and they, they stress the importance of research and um, the history of slavery and, and the land. So there's a lot more information out there that somebody could really pull together to do further research on here. So um, that is uh, the end for now. And I, I wanna see if Luke would like to say anything about the project. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, it's one of these projects that, you know, like about everything else we're working on has the big COVID asterisks on it right now of um, you know, when we'll be able to pick it back up again. But uh, this started with a um, a couple of years ago with trying to catalog our the artifacts or the archaeological sites that remain on city property in response to uh, uh, archaeological resource theft investigation that um, that we did. And um, you know, part of, you know, trying to guard against that happening in the future was to get our arms around what sites. So a couple of different ways of, of looking at protect, you know, protecting these locations. Um, one was to look at the areas that are well known and to actually do a methodical um, excavation and um, provide that information to the public, uh, make it less of a attraction to come in and, and pilfer the site and, and let people know a little bit more of the role that it lives that that it serves 
And uh, so that's kind of what we're, we started with Glen Allen um, as being one of the most high profile locations and certainly looking forward to seeing where this goes. Um, in a perfect world, we would have been able to do a little more public part of it by now, but obviously things, uh, things have been slowed down. Um, but it's also uh, an idea to get our arms around the properties that the city preserves. Uh, we, they exist for water supply, um, but they also preserve a lot more about our, our region's character and history. And a lot of that has you know, been lost over time. Um, so identifying how much we're responsible for is uh, first out the gate and then trying to protect it from further vandalism and further loss. Uh, one of the things that was most striking about an investigation we did at a, a, you know, the theft investigation from an 18th century site located elsewhere in the reservoir was the realization that uh, you know, history is written by a very small percentage of, of, our, uh, of people. And most of us will, you know, our contributions will be learned about by understanding how we lived and how we worked and you know, the, the things that we used and the things that we owned. And when that's lost to any kind of misuse, uh, the understanding of an entire culture is gone. And we're left only with the written records of those that choose to record history as they wish to see it recorded. So um, it definitely struck me as, as something you know, worth my time. And I, I think you know, worth putting some city resources uh, towards trying to, at the very least, um, and the you know, picking away at sites that were known, catalog what we have and come up with a better plan to protect them for the long term. And uh, we are hoping to do some additional digs. Uh, there are some sites you know, associated with the building of the dams that are very interesting. Uh, there's a workforce that really very little is known about, uh, you know, that were, you know, that built these reservoirs in the, um, in the early part of the 1900s. Um, I had come across all the uh, records of the original police force back from you know, 1908 and you know, pieced together some locations from there. So we're looking forward to you know, expanding this. But Glen Allen seemed like the most appropriate place to start. It's a location uh, forever associated with Lock Raven. Um, but I think the work that's already been done, you know, shows that the history that's there is far more complicated than just the, you know, the, the prominent sort of Confederate family. Uh, and that shows a lot more of a cutaway into life in our, in our region in the, in the 1800s and a much fuller picture of, of what that was like. So I really appreciate the work that the club has done. I think we're, you know, already on the right track and I look forward to, um, you know, to continue to work on this project as time and resources permit. Great. Well, thank you, Ilka and Luke and everybody from the National um, History Society of Maryland's Archaeology Club who have been working on this project. Um, we also have on the line here um, Bill Curtis, and he works for the National Park Service um, over at Hampton. And he put in the chat box a couple of um, fill in the blanks. Uh, which are interesting as well. Bill, I don't know if you want to come on and unmute and just, just chat for a second or not. Hello. I didn't mean to steal anybody's thunder, but I just had a couple tidbits that you all might have enjoyed learning a little bit more. Yeah, it said that, that John, John Ridgely recalled riding his horse to the house, I guess, to Glen Ellen and playing an old piano in there. there. Yeah, it had been abandoned for who knows how long. And he used to ride over there when he, in his youth and bang away on this ancient piano in an abandoned house. And then, and you had some other details about um, some of the, the Marion Batty. Well, the, the Baddies worked at Hampton and they, the Batty family for, uh, ended up moving to Sandy Bottom. Okay, all right. And some of the Baddies also worked at, or were made to work, were held at the Northampton Furnace. 
So there seems like there was a lot of cross pollination between the families uh, in that area. I'm sure there was. Yes. And then we have um, for Ilka, the DU means ditto. Saw that. I knew somebody on here would know that. <laughs> So we were able to solve a, mis a, a, a mystery. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys. Thank you, Marsha and Bill. Um, do we have any other questions or comments or observations from anybody about the presentation, which was awesome. Um, yes, I really enjoyed learning about, uh, about the, uh, the history of that, uh, the house. I also should mention, I forgot to say, when we went out and did the shovel test pits, the crew that went out there was very, were very hardy folk. We had actually, we were supposed to go on a Saturday and it was supposed to snow. So we postponed it to Sunday, which was supposed to be nicer. Sunday ended up being worse than Saturday. It was cold. It was rain. It was one of those cold rains. And we pretty much got soaked and people stayed there the whole time. And we, we finished our, we finished our pits. So Kudos to Archaeology Club. Bronwyn? Yes. Uh, this is Susan. I just wanted to mention that there's a great book called What Lies Beneath, and it's all about all the villages and surrounding areas that got drowned by Loch Raven. So there's probably a lot of fodder there for the Archaeological Club to, to look into. Yeah. I have, I have that book. I haven't read it yet. Oh, it's, it's, my, it's good. Yeah, I've heard I've heard very good things about it. Yeah, it's in my it's pile good. of books next to my bed. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> and um, and Jean worked on the Lock Raven Reservoir too. Jean Scarpola here is. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to say anything about the reservoir. I, I did. I love this presentation. This is fascinating. I worked for 30 years at the Baltimore City Watersheds and uh, started out as a lowly biologist <clears throat> and ended up the last eight years as the city's watershed manager. And uh, I loved projects like this. I wish this would have been started back when I was still working for the city, but I've been happily retired for 10 years now. But uh, th this was fantastic. And I did have a question for Luke. If you're still available, Luke, uh, I see you down there. Uh, is the old, the old building, uh, the old maintenance building at Lock Raven still standing, or is that been demolished? Uh, that was uh, that was demolished along with quite a bit of the old tunnel that ran from the original dam. Okay. Um, but it uh, so yeah that that's that's gone. Um, but in the in process, we managed to find a few other. A few other spots that were there were still remains, but yeah, that was uh, that was removed. What I was wondering in the old the old shop building, the fireplace that was in there. Uh, my understanding, and of course, I've been away ten years, that that uh, fireplace mantle, the wooden mantle, uh, was from Glen Ellen Castle, and it was in the maintenance building. So that's I was wondering if the maintenance building was still standing, if it was still there. I have, I have pictures of it, but uh, unfortunately that was, um, they, uh, it was demolished before CHAP could get in there. So uh, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't preserved, but we, we, I, I do have some photographs of it. Okay. Jean, was that the, cause I had read a couple articles that talked about there was a fireplace that was on Chase Street where Francis Gilmore used to live. Would that have been the same fireplace mantle or maybe there was a different one? I thought this one came from from the castle. Okay, but, but I could be wrong. It, it would make sense given the proximity to to each other and the fact that yeah. it was basically there being pilfered while the um, while a lot of those buildings were being uh, were being built to you know to house the uh, the workers and because some of the like that house that Gene is referring to actually predates the main Lock Raven Dam and was there for the, like, the original smaller reservoir. So there was, uh, they were neighbors for a long time. And um, yeah, it would certainly, it would certainly make sense that uh, some, some items made their way over there. Um, 
reservoir crews procuring things from other locations seems to be a long, long history. Yeah, both buildings would have been standing at the same time. Yep. So, well, if you've got photos of it, you can at least get those to Elka so that yep. she could see them. Yeah, no, got it. You know, well, I didn't know at the time, but when we did the buildings came in, coming down, we just went and photographed everything just to, you know, just to just to have. Very good, and it is good to see a familiar face here, also, <laughs> since I've been away. Well, Luke for one, but also Brenda Carl for another for being away from Baltimore News for ten years now. Uh, to see a familiar <laughs> face <laughs> is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Down here in Bowie, all we get is Washington news. <laughs> yeah. what, was, what was the name of the, bo of the book? Um, it was What Lies Beneath. Is that the title of it? Yes. OK. Yes. Yeah, it, it is. I got a copy of it. It, it, is, it is well done. Um, it was certainly happy to see the research. I think what we're hoping to see more of this is a uh, more yeah I think more of what can be told about some of these locations um, coming out soon and uh, Baltimore County Historical Society has been a great partner uh, in this and um, hopefully we you know, were able to do more you know more quickly but yeah it's a very good book um, it focuses heavily on Warren but it does touch on some of the other towns like the village of Bosley and some of the other um, you know some of the other uh, towns that are completely lost I went to Baltimore County Historical Society and got a lot of articles and um, all the Maryland State Archives things were only the stuff I could find online. So I think there's probably more out there. It's just a case of um, digging deeper, as we like to say in archaeology club. <laughs> so Ilka, um, for the folks that, that are more interested in, in, in joining the archaeology club and what they're doing and some of the things that they could get involved with that they like to, to work on um, the history and the research, is there something that you can, should they contact you or? Sure, sure. I'd love to, to explain more. We probably aren't going to do any um, digging actual excavation until end of summer maybe next fall the way you know COVID's looking right now but there's always you know there's always things we can research if people are interested in that um yeah and it's open to anyone and everyone all ages anyone, are welcome. And everyone all kids all you welcome. need we want, to get, we want to get people started in in this uh early in life as well as late in life if you always wanted to be be an archaeologist when you were a kid and never got to be that now you have your chance to do so that's right um, you don't have to have any experience just an interest in archaeology um, so we have our mentors are um, Dr. Lisa Krauss and Jason Schellenhammer and they're professional archaeologists we're very lucky to have them um, but there's people that have never done any of that before and um, people have done a little bit or just have an interest in it. So, yeah, we welcome everybody. And you might have, we might have a raffle um, prize coming up for one, a month coming up very soon. Not, don't want to, I don't want to spoil it, but it, an archeologically themed raffle coming up. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, and everybody, thank you so much. If you have any other questions for Ilka, Ilka, I don't want to put your 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 email in the chat box. Oh yeah, let me do that. And you can feel free to get in touch with Ilka. You can also contact me at be strong at MarylandNature.org if you have any other questions. We hope to see you at some upcoming programs mm -hmm. online and some hopefully see you in person sometime in the future near rather than than later um everybody needs to stay safe and wear their masks and um thank you again for for spending some time with us and and learning together and feeding that curiosity muscle and thank you for all the contributions from all you knowledgeable people out there take care Feel free to stay on for a second if you want to if you want to chat with with Ilka or we'll see you sometime else soon. Ilka, do you know uh, Ravens Rock? Is that what is the rocks at Lock Raven? 
or I'm not exactly sure. I thought it might be the promontory that goes out where Lock Raven Drive is. Right. Um, but there was another article that I read that said it doesn't exist anymore, that they blew it up to use the stone to make the first dam mm -hmm. in um, Lock, Lock Raven. So I'm really not sure. I've been trying to play around. I've had my little, my grandmother's little um, eye thing to try to look at the plat, but it's, it's if I can find the original of this, wherever it might be, it would help a lot because it's, they have like all the fields named. Um, so I don't know if I could be able to tell something from it if I had a good copy of the original or not. Uh, I'd love to find out where Raven, Raven Rock actually was. Uh -huh. There is a, there is the city quarry when they built the first dam that's right next to the first dam. <laughs> It's a, yeah, there's, there's a there's a second quarry site too um, in that what's kind of referred to as the um, the, the cove up from Locker and you know between uh, just south of where the Northampton furnace is. So that's also a a possibility. And there was a there is a road trace that runs under the water in that general vicinity. So it's you know it's possible. Huh. Yeah, the the, res the quarry I'm thinking of is right next to the first dam, and yep. next to it is a very significant um, outcropping that looks over those two dams. Really? Yeah, go look at my Facebook page and you'll find a picture or two from it. It looks down on the um, gunpowder, and it's a pretty significant, pretty neat outcropping. Yeah, that's where that's where the uh, that's where the dynamite shed was when they built the dam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll be careful next time I'm up there. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> be, there's I don't a, smoke. There's one rather large indentation. I'm wondering if they had an accident. <laughs> Bill, maybe you can email Ilka some of those photos. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. That'd be super. Will do. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Thank Where you. Where were you guys a couple of weeks ago when I was working on this presentation? I could have used you and Jean. <laughs> oh, you did great. It was it was a great night. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. I remember going to school with one of the Ridgelys at Towson High School. That would my, have been my class, once my one sister-in-law. Okay, my one sister-in-law went to school with uh, a descendant of Gilmore's. Hmm. Uh, but my sister-in-law grew up in uh, Towson area, and she knows everybody. Yep. <laughs> I wonder yeah. if there's anybody Sophomore. around that 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 uh, that um, roller skated in the ballroom. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Well, you know, you figure you got the local kids. They know that this big space. It's just like the kids that skateboard today. They yeah. go look for areas that they could go skateboard in. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> Can I ask a question, Ilka? Sure. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. That was really well done. I like seeing the maps. I love finding them. I can't always get out to the Baltimore County Historical Society and see them. So that was great that you could share them. And I had been out there maybe 20 years ago with family members and walked around and found that area. I was wondering, how did you guys get out there? Did you walk from... Providence Road, or did you come in from another direction? We actually had the day of the dig. Um, Luke came on his boat, so he brought uh, most of the um, material that we needed to dig. He brought that on the boat with a couple of people, and then the rest of us hiked in from Providence Road. So yeah, it was a yeah, that's a long hike. hike. Yeah, we had gone on bicycles. We have a family that lives um, on uh, Ellendale Road which backs up to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they had told us about this area, you know, we didn't know what it was. They said you it's the ruins of, you know, an old castle and we should go back there and check it out. So it was maybe 15 of us on bikes and rode back there and looked around and you could see the foundation and the trees and of course we didn't take pictures. We didn't have all the phones and technology back then, but over the years we have looked up and found some of those photographs and seen the the uh, 
things at the cloisters. We've been there to visit and seen the windows and so forth. It's just fascinating. Yeah, I, I love that when I went to the cloisters. It was a, a group of us from archaeology club. I think it was five or six of us ladies went out there. And then um, in December, I actually took my goddaughter out to do, they had a Christmas tea, which oh, I love. of course mm -hmm. they won't it's have so this pretty. year. And it's just, I don't envy much, but I envy that house. I'm like, I love this house. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, and that has a whole history to itself, you know. The people who built that apparently collected things from all over the world. All over. To build that house. Yeah. It's fascinating. But um, but I love the Towson history. And I had just started doing a, a tour of historic Towson back in March. I guess I got two tours in before, you know, this all happened and we kind of got shut down. But I was amazed at the um, interest that people had just in taking a walking tour of Towson. We started at the courthouse and went up to Prospect Hill Cemetery, circled around. There's only building up in that area. Of course, tying in Hampton Mansion and a little bit of Glen Ellen. You know, it'd be great to get a bus tour, although I don't know how we get out to Glen Ellen unless we could get a book tour. That. But um, it's just fascinating. And I think people would love to see something virtual. You know, did you have uh, more photographs from when you went out there last year for the dig? Um, I do have a, I do have some photographs that I took and I went out there a couple of times um, beforehand and afterwards to try to get measurements when I was writing up the, the um, archeology span report that we had to submit to Maryland Historical Trust. Um, so I, maybe I could, that's an idea. Maybe I could do some, um, is April still on? No, she's gone. Um, maybe we could do some kind of virtual tour of Glen Ellen. Yeah, we were, I mean, we were originally right, going to, um, just, uh... I mean, originally there was supposed to be an education component to this that as you know, we got this material together, both to give the history of the area, but also the leave no trace ethics of, of you know, preserving these sites. Um, so we, the, there is potential the city might want to do something virtually as well. Cool. Um, Anna, who's already left, she, she, she mentioned that there's a, a slave graveyard in the Willow Grove farm and that used to be owned by the Raven family in Cromwell Valley. Does anybody know about that? Or? I don't know anything about that. I know where Willow yeah. Grove is because it's on one of the one of the old maps I had, in the, I think it was on the Topo map. And she's also yeah. interested in learning about the workforce who built the balancing reservoir and the dam. Yeah, that well, there's a um, there's there was a work camp back near the balancing reservoir. It was one of three, uh, so that was kind of one of the sites of eventually getting into with this project. Um, but there was a whole kind of frontier town that was out there um, at the base of the dam and then another one over in, um, over by the Balancing Reservoir and then a third by what's now the Delaney Valley Bridge. And um, that that's kind of an interesting story in itself. Be, judging by photographs, it, it, it was an integrated work crew. Um, and there were, you know, it's a... Uh, not that much is known about the individuals, but um, the environmental police started in 1906 as an agency that was tasked with basically was put together to keep order in those work camps and then, you know, switched over into more of an environmental protection agency. Uh, but there are, you know, there's fascinating little glimpses into, into daily life and it's fairly well photographed, but, you know, it's, it's, um, there's still there's I think a lot to be uh, you know, a lot to be learned and uh, you know, a lot more about the individuals that were actually there. Um, oh, okay, and so Bill, you answered that question about the lime kilns. All right, Good. I'm glad you answered, Bill, because I had no idea. I I'm trying to find out if maybe a presentation I could do and or uh, that can be done for us is um, Adam Frackia did a archeological dig at the Northampton Furnace. 
So um, I'd asked him if he would present to us, but I haven't heard back from him yet. So I have to bug him. But I'd like to know more about that furnace too. So I think a lot of the enslaved people worked at the furnace. Yes, they did. And he um, he's planning to come back. He couldn't do another uh, dig this year because of COVID, but he still has the place in mind. Oh, good. You might know more about that, Captain Brackett, than I do. He hasn't applied for a permit yet, but um, uh, he, he did last time. Um, if, after, after we spent two years chasing him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll be. Um, I hope he is back and I'm looking forward to sharing some, um, you know, to, you know, finding out what he found out. Uh, I mean, that's uh, always, that's kind of my sort of my own personal favorite area. All right. Well, this has been wonderful. And we hope to see you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Elka. This was a great presentation. That and was good. We'll very work nice. Together on for, for, for January and 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 moving forward. Okay. Right. Thank you. Take care. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. -bye.